As pedagogy uh, is developing across universities, digital elements have to come into it. And this is something that we are kind of grappling with in all sorts of different ways. And so I want to tell a story. And I've written a, a pre-circulated paper, which is available through Colleen's blog. But I want to do this more as a kind of storytelling, as part of that kind of narrative way of getting. So uh, like all good stories, it should start with a question. Uh, how many of you are Australian? Any of you? Any of you spent any time at an Australian university? Yeah, a little. Yeah, a little. Anyone done any field work in Australia, gone on a project, gone for a, yeah, a little, OK. So this is the context. Australian archaeology is the setting, and Australian universities are the setting. Um, I'm at the Australian National University, which is the national university, which is a very high profile research university, but it's also a very small university. Uh, and it's a state funded small university, which means that student fees pay our teaching and research budgets. And since we have about a third the students of other top Australian universities like Melbourne, Sydney, uh, University of Queensland, uh, we are trying to do our kind of top research, engaged teaching, exciting stuff uh, on a very, very, very attenuated budget. Um, and so we're trying to do all these exciting things as well, but with a lot fewer resources than some of our kind of peer universities. Add to that that our student body, this is a state funded university, uh, and we're in a rural location. We're in the capital, but if any of you have ever been to Canberra, Canberra is a city of 380,000 people that once you hit the city limits, it is three hours of kangaroos in all directions. Um, that's pretty much it. You can see the Milky Way from the center of the city because there's no industry. Um, our, our student base is largely rural. Uh, our student base is largely uh, a mix of working class and kind of families of civil servants. Uh, we have a very high number of first-generation uh, first university students. We have a lot of mature students. Um, we have a lot of former military because a lot of the military is based in Canberra. Um, and all of that leads to the issue that we have a lot of students with lives outside the classroom, as many people have these days. And as teachers, that causes us problems because we teach archaeology. And archaeology is a materialist discipline, right? There are things you have to learn in archaeology that force you to engage with objects, that force you to hold things in your hand and learn how they feel and learn how they look and learn, in some cases, what happens when you touch them to your tongue. Um, look, I, I've done the stoneware thing. I'm sure other people have too, right? Licking the objects is something real. Um, but how we do that in a world where our students can't always come to class, where we have no control over when our classes are scheduled and we can't repeat things without the university centrally getting involved. Uh, where the university's idea of equity around attendance is to say that attendance isn't mandatory. So students are told from the outset that attendance at lectures and seminars is not mandatory, that no one can force them to come. Um, which means that of course we have attendance issues. Uh, and some of those are genuine and real and students have jobs and lives and children. Some of them are 19-year-olds who haven't quite got their time management together and don't want to get out of bed for a 9 a.m. lab, and that's the only lab we can run, and we can't reschedule it. Uh, so my colleague, Sophia Sumpercaro, and I started talking, and I've brought props, because the point of this is to talk about the materiality and the digital of things. I have props. These are 3D printed wombat skulls. They're in two different materials. Please look. Pass. Try and get your hands on both of them if you can. Feel the differences. Have a look at them. Sophia is an archaeozoologist. Uh, and she was trying to come up with ways to teach students bone identification when they couldn't always come to labs because our materials live in boxes in the basement uh, and aren't accessible to students without a lecturer present. And we thought, well, maybe we can develop what we're calling a bone library. We can 3D print uh, some animal bones, particularly skulls. Uh, and we can um, make those available. Students can sign them out from the office and borrow them and basically check them out for a few hours to practice and to play with them themselves in their own time when they're available. Uh, and we said, but how are we going to do this? We don't have the resources to do this. At which point we started saying, well, why don't we make this a bigger pedagogical project? We have friends in digital humanities. They have fancy digital 3D scanning equipment. Let's go talk to them. And between the four of us, Katrina Grant and Terry Nermiko Fuller, uh, who are our friends in digital humanities, uh, and Sophia and I, we put together a project we call the Skullbook Project, uh, which is an entirely student-led project designed to uh, embed some of these ideas of grappling with materials and then building digital um, and also 3D printed 
new versions of those materials out of them. Uh, so what we did was to say, right, all the scanning is going to be done by digital humanities students. Sophia and I came into the classroom with a box of skulls uh, and we handed them out to a bunch of students who'd never studied archaeology, never touched a bone in their life, and were, I'm not going to lie, a little freaked out by the fact that they were holding skulls in their hands. Uh, explained what archaeologists like to look at. We said, we really need to see the teeth and the sutures. Those are things that are important to us um, in order to identify them. And said, all right, have at. They were given kind of larger tools and techniques for scanning. But Katrina and Terry, who run that methods class, uh, decided instead of telling them how to do it, they would just give them a variety of workflows and say, OK, your project is to invent your own workflow. Um, while we were talking, the students were handling the skulls, just as you're handling skulls now, getting familiar with the kind of heft and feel, the bits and pieces of them. Uh, and that's what they did over the course of the semester. They played with them. They got to know their skull really intimately. And they developed, in groups, three different versions of the scan. Uh, some of them worked. Some of them didn't work so well. Some of them really, really weren't usable in terms of archaeology. This middle one, for example, um, very clean, but of course no sutures, really poor teeth. Um, but that's the digital world, right? You experiment, you explore, you try something, you create iterations, you fail, and you create another iteration. Uh, from this, we invited uh, one of the most successful students, and we had them write reflections on this process. And one of the ones who was writing really good reflections, we invited her to be an intern, I should say a paid intern, on the project, uh, and said, why don't you kind of elaborate on your method? Uh, she's the one who produced this scan of the underside of the wombat skull. Um, why don't you elaborate on your method and 3D scan five skulls for us? Um, and we do have a Sketchfab page, and she did really, really beautiful scans of these skulls as part of our project. Uh, and we've printed the Wombat Skull, the first of them out. Uh, and that was also a process of experiment and revision and revising. Because you'll notice as you're passing that they are two different materials and two very different qualities. One is printed in plastic and is not usable for archaeological identification purposes, but is very cool looking. Uh, and one is printed in a much heavier and shinier resin and actually is very useful. And that's what we're going to be printing these out in. Uh, we're going to be making all of the scans as we develop them. Uh, they're all available right now in Sketchfab. We're also going to put them up on the ANU website. All of the 3D models will also be up on the ANU website. So if you ever want to print your own Wombat skull, uh, you will be able to very soon uh, in any color you want. We, we spent some time thinking if the first version should be sparkly purple, but uh, our slightly gothy Finnish digital humanities collaborator insisted on shiny black. Uh, was fine. We let her. Uh, but the point of all of this is, uh, that what we were trying to do was, to a certain extent, develop a teaching collection, but also push back against these university structures that force us into certain sorts of teaching. We were trying to put students at the center of our teaching as much as possible. And these two very different conversations that I and many of my colleagues have been having, first about pedagogy and student engagement, uh, disrupting the hierarchy of the classroom, disrupting the hierarchy of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination, and then second, resources available and opening the classroom to greater equity, making the classroom friendly for students who have lives outside it. Uh, we're able to come together in this space that both uh, embraces the digital, but also I think disrupts it as well. Because the whole point of it is not necessarily to create a digital world to disrupt our classroom, but to create an alternate material world to kind of decenter the real objects to give more students that hands-on material, lick the artifact experience. And that's where I'll stop.